Hello, everyone. Uh, the American dream is, dream is alive and well. A shining example of this is the state of Connecticut. And our plenary session today is about Connecticut of hope and tolerance across our communities, our talented workforce, great old businesses, and the promising new ventures that thrive here. This is possible due to the great set of panelists, the political and business leaders from Connecticut that are present here today, who are the architects of policymaking and also knows that the world of business and economy are never built without compromising, uh, with, by not compromising on our shared values of tolerance and respect, social justice, diversity, and fairness. I'm delighted to introduce our moderator, Dita Bhargava, who is the Chief Operating Officer of Catalan Investments, an Emerging Manager Quantitative Fund headquartered in Stamford, Connecticut. Dita, an electrical engineer, has over 20 years of experience in Wall Street as a hedge fund portfolio manager and a banker. Dita is an active leader in civic engagement and philanthropic efforts that help empower equity for women, promote cultural understanding, equity amongst socioeconomic classes, and also help drive public policy. In 2018, Dita ran for statewide office in Connecticut. Dita has been a Connecticut resident since 2008 with her husband and two children. Dita embodies everything that is good about the USA and our state, Connecticut. Here is Dita. Thank you. Thank you so much, Avi. And, and thanks to Frank Jurgen Richter for putting this incredible forum on today. I'm Dita Bargava, and I want to thank all our panelists and attendees for joining us this morning. It is my honor to start this session with a brief video presentation from a proud Connecticut resident, former CEO of PepsiCo, Mrs. Indra Nui. Avi, please commence. Good afternoon. My name is Indra Nui, former chairman and CEO of PepsiCo. I'm here today to talk to you about Connecticut, the state I'm blessed to call home. I'm one of the fortunate people of this world that can live wherever I choose, and I choose Connecticut. If you're not familiar with the state, it's the third smallest state in the US, strategically positioned between New York City and Boston, with a population of about three and a half million people. You know, we are small, but we punch way beyond our weight. Connecticut is home to two Fortune 100 companies, 13 Fortune 500 companies, and 25 Fortune 1000 companies. We are a beautiful state. We have mountains. We have a 332 mile long coastline, which makes us one of the few sea to ski states in the US. Every resident in Connecticut is within a 15 minute drive of a park. To say we have it good here would be an understatement. We also have a world-class healthcare system, one of the top-ranked education systems in the United States, and so many other benefits that it's just hard to list them all off here. Businesses who are in Connecticut find the talent they need, and their businesses thrive here in the state. You know, successful companies pick the best location for their businesses, but transformative companies pick the best location for their people. The bottom line, Connecticut is a place you should look to if you're looking to locate your business. You know, it's said that a picture says a thousand words. So I'm gonna leave you with the following images to tell Connecticut's story. Wow. So as Mrs. Nui so eloquently highlighted in her video, Connecticut is a beautiful 
innovative, strategically located state in America. We may be a small state, but we make a significant impact on our country, both politically and economically. Our state has a long and proud history that includes innovation, hard work, political reform, and a commitment to education. We are the Constitution State precisely because we were the first of the original 13 colonies to have a written governing document widely believed to have inspired the U.S. Constitution. I believe that the best days are still ahead for Connecticut. We have many strengths that we can harness with a top three ranking in the percentage of employees with advanced degrees and a top four ranking for the most innovative workforce. We enjoy an important geographic location in the Northeast, as Mrs. Newey pointed out, which generates roughly about 20% of the country's GDP. So with that introduction, I'm excited to start our discussion on Connecticut. And we have um, some very busy leaders um, who need to get to uh, committee meetings and um, testimonies and um, conferences. So I'm going to start with you, Senator Blumenthal. Senator Blumenthal, who was originally sworn in as United States Senator from the state of Connecticut on January 5th, 2011, and is serving his second term now. He's a member of the Veterans Affairs, Judiciary, Armed Services, and Commerce, Science, and Transportation Committees. Previously, Senator Blumenthal served an unprecedented five terms with Connecticut's Attorney General fighting for people against large and powerful special interests. Hmm. Senator Blumenthal graduated from Harvard and Yale Law School, where he was editor-in-chief of the Yale Law Journal. From 1970 to 1976, he served in the United States Marine Corps Reserves and was honorably discharged with the rank of sergeant. Senator Blumenthal, I know you have an important committee meeting. Here's the first question for you. Recently, U.S. Congress passed a historic $1.9 trillion stimulus relief bill to help struggling families most impacted by the COVID pandemic. One of the bill's largest spending items was a profound investment in local government, $350 billion earmarked for state, local, and tribal governments. Could you talk about the impact of this bill, Connecticut, which will receive about $10 billion in relief? Uh, Thank you so much, Dita, and thank you for your leadership over so many years. The brief description given of your career fails to do justice to the extraordinary contributions you've made to our state and even to our nation. And I just really want to thank you personally for all you've given back to Connecticut and to all of us as your friends. And let me say, uh, I do have to be at three or four places at the same time this morning, as I'm sure Jim Himes, my great colleague on the House, does as well. So I'm going to be brief and hopefully concise in answering your question. The answer very simply is this American Rescue Plan is truly historic. It's revolutionary in what it does for Connecticut and for the country. It puts vaccine shots in people's arms. It puts money in their pockets and it will put our kids back to school in Connecticut and around the country safely. I underscore safely. And of course, there are billions coming to Connecticut in vaccine delivery alone. There are $277 million coming to aid childcare alone. There's the child tax credit, which lifts out of poverty thousands of children in Connecticut and millions around the country. And in terms of our basic workforce, it will provide more support for those men and women on the assembly lines. You saw some of them in the video making more engines for the F-35, more submarines, the Virginia class and the Columbia class submarines and helicopters. It's, of course, be vital to our national defense. Connecticut truly is the arsenal of democracy, and we're going to need more skill training for those jobs that will be created by the contracts. One of them actually is going to be announced later today. So this measure provides all kinds of support for the people and workers and families of Connecticut, but the 350 million, close to 400 million, that uh, billion, I should say, going to our towns and cities and states will be coming to Connecticut. It can be used flexibly 
by the towns to retain their police and fire and first responders on their payrolls to deliver that vaccine at the local level. I've visited, uh, I don't know how many vaccine clinics around the state, probably 20 to 30 in total, and many rely on our National Guard, but also on local workers. They can be reimbursed for COVID-related expenses. And of course, at the state level, uh, the Connecticut legislature has moved ahead. And I want to say our governor, Ned Lamont, with the help of an extraordinary team, including Lieutenant Governor Bicewitz, they've done great work. Uh, the chief operating officer, Josh Gabal, the entire team has managed this crisis with remarkable dexterity, courage, and vision. And so this package really rewards and recognizes Connecticut's being at the forefront. First, taking shutdown measures that were necessary to stem the spread and now reopening with caution and prudence and at the same time delivering the vaccine on a rational, very understandable basis. We're going to go on vaccine from scarcity to abundance, literally scarcity to abundance because of the American Rescue Plan, which will enable exponentially increased manufacture and delivery of the vaccine to states like Connecticut that have forged the infrastructure. That's so important what Ned Lamont has done, forged the infrastructure necessary to deliver it. So it, it is historic. It's revolutionary. It will lift kids out of poverty. It will put them back to school. It will enable people safely to go back to restaurants and public places. It's targeted a program of aid to restaurants and other businesses, small businesses that desperately need to get over this chasm of economic crisis. And uh, I think it's especially important for our export trade because we are, after all, an exporting state, not only in the defense industry, but also in so many others where we're at the lead in tech and uh, other kinds of medical manufacturing. So thanks very much for that question, Dita. And yeah, and just, um, just a, a quick follow up. And, and uh, like you said, the leadership in Connecticut is extraordinary. And, that, and I think that's why we are in the top three in terms of vaccine rollout. But you mentioned trade and uh, we have an international audience here. Uh, and needless to say, our global economies are interlinked and codependent. Could you speak about this stimulus package and other U.S. policies, uh, recovery policies that will help global growth after profoundly sharp decline in, in the global economy in 2020? What is the U.S. doing to help the rest of the world recover? Uh, that's such a great question, Dita. Uh, you know, Jake Sullivan, the new national security assistant for the president, recently said, uh, we've focused in the past on slowing down China. Now we need to focus on speeding up America. And Connecticut can play such an important part. David Lehman and uh, the governor as entrepreneurs, they know the business world, they've worked in it, they've led efforts to export and increase manufacture, I think will create a kind of renewal, uh, a next chapter in our export that will enable Connecticut to become more competitive and set a model for the nation to become more competitive. Uh, I've met with David coming to Connecticut. Uh, Jim Himes has been in the business world as well. He is very attuned as not only a member of the Intelligence Committee, but uh, in his work on foreign affairs to the competition we face abroad. So I, I really believe that Connecticut is well positioned, not just in what we're doing now, but what we're aspiring to do in the future to become a leader of the United States and helping the United States to be more competitive and run faster, run faster than our adversaries, which we need to do in not only as a matter of economic prosperity, but our national security. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much again, Senator Blumenthal, for taking out the time. I really appreciate it. And, and good luck in your in your meetings today. I'm going to turn over to Lieutenant Governor Bicewitz, who also has uh, a few minutes with us. Thank you so much again for, for attending today.
Uh, Lieutenant Governor Susan Bysowitz was sworn in on January 9th, 2019, and is serving her first term as Connecticut's 109th Lieutenant Governor. Lieutenant Governor Bysowitz formerly served as Connecticut Secretary of State from 1999 to 2011, and as a state representative in the Connecticut General Assembly from 1993 to 1999. Lieutenant Governor Bysowitz graduated from Middletown High School, Yale University, and Duke Law School. She is the author of Ella, a biography of Ella Grasso, our first female governor, correct? Um, yes. Connecticut's 83rd governor, actually, and first female governor. Uh, Lieutenant Governor Bysowitz, investing in working women is low hanging fruit when targeting an increase in GDP. Connecticut has been a leader in progressive policies that help women stay in the workforce, such as equal pay and paid family leave. Could you talk about these policies and other Connecticut initiatives that will have help Connecticut businesses and families? Dita, thank you so much for your leadership uh, on so many economic and important social issues like fighting the opioid uh, epidemic. We really appreciate your leadership. And I love this question and it's one of my favorite topics uh, because I think women's issues are economic issues. And when you uplift uh, women, you uplift families. And uh, we know uh, here in Connecticut that female talent is one of our most underutilized business resources. And we are doing a lot to uplift women in our state. Uh, we have passed a, the most progressive paid family leave law in the country, uh, and that will motivate women to stay in the workforce uh, because they're not going to have to choose between caring for a sick uh, parent or child or loved one and uh, a job that they love. Um, this bill went into effect in January uh, of this year, and for one year, a tiny percentage of uh, a paycheck will go into a fund to provide that uh, paid leave. And we're very, very um, excited about that. Um, this program covers all employees with at least one employee in Connecticut. So it's very exciting. And this um, payroll deduction of 0.5% of a person's income uh, is starting to be withdrawn from folks' paychecks and the program will be fully operational um, next year. And so we're so excited about what that means for the future of our state in terms of heightening workplace morale and productivity. I'll just mention a, a couple of other forward thinking um, policies that we have in place here. Uh, in Connecticut, and it's one of the reasons why Wallet Hub has designated Connecticut as one of the most family-friendly states um, in our country. We also um, are ranked third in our country for the number of people with advanced degrees, and we have the fifth most highly educated workforce in the United States. So we're great for all kinds of businesses were ranked fourth in the nation in terms of productivity and we are home to two fortune 100 companies 13 fortune 500 companies and 26 fortune 1000 companies we've got lots of great businesses here and our policies on paid family leave um, a very high uh, minimum wage and pay equity make it really a great place to come I do want to mention that, as Senator Blumenthal was alluding to, um, more than 17,000 new families came to Connecticut over the past year because of our um, very good public health uh, policies with respect to COVID-19. We have, as a result of all those new people who want to come to Connecticut because of our very high vaccination rate and our very low COVID-19 positivity rate, um, our real estate market is booming because so many people want to come. And to the companies who are wondering about our uh, budget policies, um, Governor Lamont has released his second budget 
which does not increase um, personal or corporate taxes, which I think sends a very positive message uh, to businesses. And also, um, there are um, no new tax increases, and our rating agencies have noted that we have um, a very high rainy day fund, one of the biggest in the Northeast and one of the biggest in the country. So we are, I think, well positioned going forward. And the governor and I and Commissioner Lehman are regularly in conversations with uh, ambassadors and council generals and business leaders from around the globe. We welcome you and um, we are just a phone call away. So please call us. We'd love to have your business locate in our state. That's wonderful, Lieutenant Governor. And if I could just follow up because you mentioned a whole list and I just want to add one thing, because when I speak to friends across the world, there is certainly the perception that the prevalence of guns mm -hmm. in the United States makes it a less safe place to live or operate business. And uh, Connecticut ranked as the fourth safest state in 2020 for personal and residential safety and ninth overall safest state period. So could you speak a little bit about our gun, uh, gun laws and the safety in our communities? Thank you so much for raising that. And thank you for your advocacy on gun safety uh, measures. Connecticut has among the strongest gun safety laws in the country. And it is a proven uh, fact uh, that the states with the toughest gun safety measures are the safest and have the lowest levels of gun violence. And so we remain a leader um, in our, our country for passing gun safety measures. And uh, that's yet another reason we have a beautiful environment. It's a very safe place to live. And it's another reason why we welcome people from around the world. Great. Well, thank you again, Lieutenant Governor, for the great job that you're doing and uh, for taking the time out of your busy morning today. We Thanks appreciate for, it. Thanks for having me. Congressman Himes, uh, I know you have a very busy morning as well. So again, thank you for being here. Uh, it's it's a busy time in Washington, as I can imagine. Uh, Congressman Himes represents Connecticut's fourth district in the United States House of Representatives, uh, serving his sixth term. He serves on both the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence and the House Committee on Financial Services, where he is the chairman of the National Security, International Development, and Monetary Policy Subcommittee. Born in Lima, Peru in 1966 to American parents, he spent the early years of his childhood in Peru and Colombia while his father worked for the Ford Foundation and UNICEF. Thank you, and, you, and also he's a neighbor, lives in uh, Coscob, Connecticut. Uh, welcome, Congressman Himes. Uh, I would like to ask you about um, the newfound stability in the U.S. Uh, many would say that there is newfound stability in the U.S. after the 2020 presidential election and the start of the Biden administration. Do you agree with this assessment? What has a post-Trump era meant for strengthening relationships internationally and how will this impact our state of Connecticut? Yeah, great question, Dita, and thank you. Thanks so much for inviting me to participate with uh, with uh, my friend Susan and, and the Senator and David and others uh, to talk about Connecticut, and thank you for your friendship uh, and, and hard work in, in all of the areas that have been enumerated today. You're everywhere. Um, so great question, and, and I'm glad to field that question because I was probably, um, uh, well, I was an up-close and personal witness, obviously, to the moment that I think was most uh, uh, shameful um, with respect to political instability in the United States. I was in the chamber of the House of Representatives on January 6th when the, uh, when the uh, Capitol was assaulted. Um, and so I, I can tell you that the answer is unequivocally yes. Um, you know, uh, and, and that is demonstrated by the fact that, um, and, and, I'll, and I'll endeavor not to be overly partisan in my explanation here, but it's demonstrated by the fact that the American people roundly rejected the ethno-nationalistic, uh, right-wing, um, nostalgic, if I could use a euphemistic word, uh, for, a, for a past that never really existed, um, a much less inclusive past than our present. Uh, the American people rejected that um, soundly, soundly. It rejected it by electing Joe Biden by a popular margin of 8 million votes. 
Uh, it rejected it by handing the control of the Congress in unitary fashion to the Democratic Party, which it acted as the resistance against that. Um, and, and, you know, I know we have an international viewership here. Uh, we were all shocked by what happened on January 6th. But of course, this is not a uniquely American phenomenon. The rise of sort of right wing, ethno nationalistic, uh, quasi autocratic leaders um, uh, is happening all over the world. And there's a lot of reasons for that. It probably has something to do with globalization, with change, with uh, a reaction to uh, immigration in a lot of our in a lot of our countries. Um, but the United States um, and, and uh, you know, you don't need to take it from me. You can just look at the, uh, the results of the election uh, to see the extent to which we have um, rejected that. Um, and the subject, of course, is Connecticut. Um, I represent uh, 750,000 people in Connecticut who spent four years bewildered um, by the rise of this right wing, ethno nationalistic, quasi authoritarian way of thinking about things. Um, and that's demonstrated by the fact that it was really a bipartisan rejection of that instinct in the state of Connecticut. Now, if you're a member of the Democratic Party, as I am, there's a happy partisan consequence to that uh, on Election Day. But uh, let me not dwell on that. But to point out that in our most Republican um, areas in the state, including the town in which you and I live, um, and including surrounding towns in Fairfield County, which is generations worth of Republican tradition, the Republican Party um, uh, loudly and clearly rejected Trumpism. Um, many people watching this uh, won't, won't know how Republican a place like Greenwich or Darien or New Canaan, these are iconic Republican places. And they said, oh, not quite unanimously, but they said Republicans in those towns said, we will have no more of this. Um, and so I, I, I mentioned that to point out the fact that no more than uh, Hungary or uh, Russia or any other place in the world have we completed the project of sort of returning to an internationalist, thoughtful, uh, you know, charitable way of thinking about our role in the world. We still have some work to do there. But that was an instinct that was always profoundly foreign uh, to the state of Connecticut. Great. Some great points there. And I think um, for those who are uh, viewing internationally and have been looking at us over the last four or five years, I think I think uh, the conclusion is that there is probably stability all across our world uh, with the new administration, and just more certain uh, certainty on the horizon. Uh, I want to now introduce our commissioner of the Connecticut Department of Economic and Community Development Commissioner David Lehman. Uh, the, this is a state agency that oversees a wide range of programs promoting business growth in Connecticut. David also serves as the governor's senior economic advisor. He is hard at work at creating an innovative public-private partnership between DECD and Advanced Connecticut that will provide a new economic development delivery model for Connecticut. Uh, before joining DECD, David was global head of real estate finance for the investment banking division of Goldman Sachs. Welcome, Commissioner Lehman, and, and thank you for being here today. Thank you for all that you are doing to help uh, Connecticut grow, uh, bring businesses in, and thank you for helping us uh, prepare for today's uh, session. Um, I will ask you the next question, if you don't mind, if you could talk a little bit about, uh, well, Connecticut has been the top five states for the rollout for the COVID vaccine, as we talked about before. And uh, Governor Lamont recently announced that all residents over the age of 16 would be vaccine eligible by April 5th. Yes. Uh, we have also carefully been reopening the state, which has helped residents and businesses get back to work. 20,000 people migrated to Connecticut in 2020. I think it's fair to say that Connecticut has done an admirable, jo admirable job handling the challenges presented by the pandemic. Could you tell us about what our state is doing specifically to increase job growth, attract new businesses, and expand our tax base? Dita, thank you. Uh, and I feel like I'm, I'm talking here after five or six of our best salespeople, so I'll, I'll do my best. Uh, but, you know, it's a great question. And as you mentioned, you know, the, the approach of the current administration is, is balanced. 
uh, and you saw this in COVID, you're seeing it with our vaccine rollout. Uh, we're focused on outcomes, not an ideology. This isn't a political point, whether it's uh, vaccine or COVID or economic growth. We're focused on outcomes and we really look at the data. So when we think about attracting business, it's about creating the environment for uh, the state to succeed. And at the business level, small or large, as well as at the household level. And there's really four pillars of that. First and foremost is tax certainty. And Lieutenant Governor Bicewitz mentioned this, but Governor Lamont's been very, very outspoken on not raising taxes. Uh, we think businesses and families need tax certainty from states to understand and make their own investments. So that's been really critical for us uh, in providing tax certainty to businesses and families is really important from the governor's perspective uh, and, and making sure that we get those investments that are going to be so crucial for jobs and growth over the coming years. The second pillar is infrastructure, and we've seen this in COVID, whether it's roads or rail or airports or specifically broadband and access as it relates to remote work. Connecticut actually was the number one ranked state for broadband access most recently. Uh, and we are also home to, many folks don't know this, the, the busiest commuter rail uh, in the United States, which is the New Haven line into New York City. So making, whether it's broadband investments or continued investments in upgrading our roads, rail and airports, uh, that's a key initiative of the governors that we'll continue to do. Third is workforce, and this came up today as well. You know, Connecticut has one of the most educated and the most productive on a per GDP basis per capita, uh, workforces in the country. Uh, and that's long been uh, a strong suit of Connecticut's, but we're, we're making the investments to make sure that that continues. There's a workforce council that's led by the private sector, uh, telling the government and educators what skills they're looking for. Uh, and we have over 200,000 college students in the state of Connecticut, uh, places like Yale University, UConn, and they're working very, very closely with businesses. Uh, in addition, Connecticut was ranked the fourth most innovative state behind uh, behemoths like California, Massachusetts, even Washington State. Folks don't think about Connecticut like that, but we have significant R&D density, patent creation, uh, and advanced degrees in the state of Connecticut. So education and workforce is going to be that third key. And we're making sure, as Lieutenant Governor said, if you're a business in Connecticut, you can find the people you need. That, that's not going to constrain your growth in Connecticut. Uh, and last, fourth is, is cities. You know, Connecticut has, we don't have very large cities. We're close to Boston and New York as seen, and we're a very dense state. Uh, but we have very uh, uh, dynamic and growing smaller cities like Stanford and New Haven. Stanford's very proximate to New York City for those that are not as familiar with the state, uh, but it's been growing immensely. In particular, dense transit-oriented development has been leading that growth. And places like New Haven, which is home to Yale University, has also been a huge growth area. So you're seeing, especially in COVID and as we come out of COVID, um, the attractiveness of those smaller cities, uh, making where you have the amenities uh, in many of the larger cities, but at a fraction of the cost and more livable. So those are the four pillars that we're, we're using to really drive growth here and, and attract businesses. But more importantly, make sure businesses that are here can grow and succeed here. Thank you, David. And, and I want to focus in on something particular that you talked about, which is transportation. You spoke about the New Haven line. And uh, I think if you look across the country and across the world, most would agree that transportation infrastructure is a major pillar to be able to grow the economy. Uh, if you look at the city of Boston, you know, they, th there's a lot of uh, residents there who don't have cars, uh, because their transportation infrastructure is so great. I'm going to ask uh, Congressman Himes to talk a little bit uh, about uh, investment in infrastructure, because it is a policy, Congressman, that you have supported in Congress. Uh, former President Trump campaigned on a $1 trillion infrastructure plan, which never came to fruition. Uh, and in fact, the American Society of Civil Engineers said in their two, 2021 report card that the U.S. needs to spend about just over $2.5 trillion over the next 10 years just to bring our current infrastructure to a state of good repair. So the $1 trillion uh, uh, package that that that's former President Trump had proposed was not nearly enough to fix what we have. So can you speak about what infrastructure investments can, we can expect to come out of the Biden administration and how this will impact the state of Connecticut? Yeah, a terrific question, Dita. Really sensitive question um, for the state of Connecticut. Um, you know, it maybe hasn't been crystallized in this way, but uh, Connecticut has a lot of advantages. The, the, uh, in my opinion, the two top, of course, are the things that God gave us, our location, our topography. You know, my, my house is uh, 45 minutes from Kennedy Airport, downtown Manhattan, not far from Boston. 
uh, you know, it's a, it's a staggeringly beautiful place to live. Uh, and it's people. It's people. I mean, at the end of the day, our competitive advantage in Connecticut is the training, the education, the capability, the entrepreneurial mindset of our people. Um, people uh, operate well only when they're embedded in really 21st century infrastructure. Uh, and that means everything from how fast can you get into New York City or up to Boston? How fast can you commute into Stanford, Connecticut? Because Stanford actually has more commuters into Stanford these days than it does out of Stanford into uh, into other places. So um, infrastructure is real. And, it, and of course, it's not just business, right? Um, it's 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 quality of life. Um, so uh, this has been probably 50 percent of my uh, attention in the years that I've been in the Congress, because if we don't get that right, uh, we lose our, our arguably our, our, our chief competitive advantage. Uh, and it has been very frustrated, can, frustrating, candidly. Um, you know, the country, our country collectively has really been begging for a major infrastructure package for uh, as long as I've been in public service, well more than a decade. Um, and we always seem to falter on, on one issue or another. It's easy for, uh, Americans to not prioritize infrastructure as they, as much as they might, because of course these are long projects, uh, often taking years to accomplish. And it's, it's hard in a democracy to pay today for things that aren't going to, uh, benefit you for five, seven, ten years. Um, okay, so we had Donald Trump's, and I was very, very hopeful, uh, though not a fan of President Trump. I thought, okay, he's a builder. You know, he would really understand the important of inf importance of infrastructure. And sadly, because there was such chaos in that administration, um, it's sort of a running joke in Washington. Infrastructure week never happened. <laughs> so, um, but in the intervening time, two things happened. And this points us in the direction of, of why I think we're going to succeed. Number one, um, Joe Biden was elected and Joe Biden coming from the Northeast as he does understands. And there's a reason they call him Amtrak Joe, right? He understands our mass transit better than perhaps than any president we've ever had. Uh, and of course, the COVID catastrophe highlighted um, how essential it is to think broadly about our, our infrastructure, not just our roads and bridges, but our broadband penetration uh, in a world where we have to do distance learning and um, and telemedicine. We come to understand that broadband universality is as important as a safe bridge. So um, all of that is is prologue to saying um, we've already made a bit of a down payment. You heard the number, $10 billion coming into the state of Connecticut. Some of that money can be used for infrastructure, specifically water projects, sewer projects, broadband projects, electricity projects. So we're already underway with a major investment in our infrastructure. That's money that will be delivered to uh, uh, to David's accounts in the next couple of weeks or so. Um, but but what's more exciting, frankly, is um, is the commitment of the presidential administration to um, uh, to what we've been talking about for a long time, which is, you know, let's just say $2 trillion, because that's in the ballpark of what engineers tell us must be invested nationally. Um, and because, again, we have those, a one party has the presidency, the Senate and the House, we've actually got, I think, as best a chance as we've had in a, in a very long time of, of getting that done. I would just close with the observation that while our politics are still at the national level quite polarized, um, infrastructure is one of those things that um, creates anxiety for uh, every elected official, regardless of their of their party affiliation or where they land on the political spectrum. There's almost nobody here in the United States Capitol who would say, yeah, our infrastructure is just fine. Let's worry about other things. So I'm I'm really quite hopeful and confident that in the next year or so, we will make real progress on making the investments that we need to make to bring all of the country up into a 21st century uh, uh, context. Wonderful. That's fantastic. And David, if you have any follow up, uh, we know, as I mentioned, transit oriented development hubs are particularly appealing to millennials since they prefer a low maintenance lifestyle that does not rely on necessarily owning a car. Are there innovative finance techniques being considered for Connecticut, like a state infrastructure bank, for example, to help modernize and develop a number of our cities to attract younger workers? with more moderately priced housing? Uh, so a lot to unpack there. There, there are, uh, and there's actually a bill, I believe, that's being considered again this year for an infrastructure bank, but there are a, a number of uh, either public or quasi-public entities that can help with financing. As you mentioned in my intro, public-private partnerships are really a cornerstone. Um, so we're looking to work with the private sector and leverage those dollars in any way we can. Uh, and if there's new vehicles that are needed to do that, we're, we're certainly looking to consider it. In addition, um, you know, the, the administration is very focused on transparent, simple incentives uh, for 
for investment in our cities in particular around TOD. So sales tax abatements, for example, as well as job creation incentives. So that that has been and will continue to be a big focus of the administration. And it's where we see our growth. Wonderful. We have an, uh, a, a comment slash question um, from Megan Smith. Um, she talks about the U.S. Census team creating the Opportunity Project to empower more use of data sets that could be engaged by third party via APIs to solve on more of our harder challenges, poverty, education, justice, housing, and homelessness um, that can now better leverage regional and national data sets. I think, Jim, you talked a little bit about um, broadband access and uh, you know programs in, in the stimulus uh, project. Um, uh, I don't know if you wanna add anything more. I don't know if you can see Megan's comments, um, but if you have anything more to add on, on, on the Opportunity Project or um, what is in that bill to help, uh, you know, sort of the, the connectivity for the, the um, socioeconomic classes that may not have access to it. Uh, very quickly, I, I can't see the question, but um, but I think I get the gist. Um, um, it's a it's a technical but really important question. Um, uh, it's a it's a little discussed um, asset that we have in this country, but the data that we collect through the um, the every decade census is an immensely rich source of information for everyone, for businesses that are thinking about markets, uh, for public policy people who are thinking about how to best uh, uh, do things like locate hospitals and invest educational dollars. Um, sadly, in the last four years, the census process became highly politicized in the service, I think, of, uh, of this instinct to, to, to uh, put it simply, to pick on immigrants. Um, which I think is behind us now, uh, thank goodness. Um, but uh, so we're in the process of depoliticizing the census uh, so that it remains the kind of incredible, if somewhat hidden asset that it is for all kinds of people, including, and, and maybe this was the direction the, the question was going, um, you know, let's face it, in the state of Connecticut, because we are an enormously prosperous state with lots of capital capital and lots of human capital, uh, we also struggle with something that the rest of the country and, quite frankly, the rest of the world struggles with, which is inequitable distribution in the state of Connecticut. Um, and so we have a lot of work to do. And, and people like me and my colleagues spend a lot of time thinking about how can we address the, um, the needs and challenges that are literally right next door. Um, and of course, having good data is the starting point for that because when you know where there are opportunities to improve affordable housing, when you know where there are opportunities to do a much better job with job training and education, when you have that data, now you can begin to, to, to solve that problem. I, I hope that captures it, not having seen the detail of the question. No, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. Well, we are uh, just a couple of minutes away from wrapping up. I, I would just love some closing comments from both of you. David, uh, given this conference's strong international participation, what would you like to highlight about the Lamont administration in incentives, policies, uh, and infrastructure for foreign companies looking to invest and do business in Connecticut? And how can you help them navigate this process? In, in 60 seconds or less, right? Sure. You uh, have uh, I'll do my best. I see we're uh, I see we're at time here. I mean, as as uh, as was mentioned before, you know, Connecticut, we're exceptionally strong. And let me just list a few.